Um, so we're really privileged to have Professor Matt Edwards here. I'm so glad you could come up. Uh, Matt uh, got his bachelor's degree at University of California in Santa Barbara, for any of you who went there. And he got his master's degree at Moss Landing and was a part of that group that did a lot of diving back in the old days. They're all well known now. And he got his PhD at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, now he's a professor at uh, San Diego State University where he does a lot of teaching, a lot of research. And just recently, I just read, he got uh, the undergraduate, uh, let's see, the San Diego Science Educator Association's University Educator of the Year for San Diego. So he's quite well known for his teaching. Uh, he is a, a true uh, subtitle ecologist, <coughs> and it's something I think we need a lot more of here. And today, what he's going to do, he's going to talk to us on changes in benthic diversity and ecosystem production following widespread kelp loss in the Aleutian Archipelago and the gorgeous pictures. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you all for having me. Thanks, Gail and Cinnamon, for inviting me and being really, really good about um, facilitating and everything. Um, we love coming up to Oregon, a family in the area. It's, uh, uh, place that is near and dear to our hearts and it's just a beautiful place to be and you have a great facility here. Um, <clears throat> so I do want to um, talk with you today about some collaborative work I've done on, as Gail mentioned, on the changes that we've seen within the Aleutian Archipelago. And you know, we always talk about standing on the shoulders of giants and things. And so my work is actually built upon a bunch of work that's come before me. Um, and then we've kind of taken this to the next level. So some of you will be aware of um, some of the work that um, I will kind of motivate the, the talk on today. But before I do that, I really have to mention that this is a truly a collaborative project. As I go through the talk today, you're going to realize there's no way, even with a couple of graduate students in my life, we could have done this work. Um, it's a huge effort. And particularly, I want to um, acknowledge my co-PI on the last three NSFs we've had that have kind of generated a lot of the information for this. And that's Dr. Brenda Kohner from Alaska Fairbanks. And then Dr. Ju Young Kim um, from Korea, from Kunsan University. Um, he's someone that brought a lot of physiology into my lab when he was a postdoc, um, and he's now a professor over there and someone that's really helped kind of take the story to the next level. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the way to start the how to think about the, what I want to talk to you today about is just thinking about species and their environment and the truism that some species have larger impacts on their ecosystems than others do. And this can come in a, the form of a number of ways. One of them might come in the form of foundation species, things that create habitat, uh, modify the environment, uh, the abiotic and biotic conditions for things, provide food and habitat, provide energy for their environment. And in this, um, really, we can take a, a lesson from terrestrial forests. Those of you who have gone hiking in a forest, you look at the forest, they have a canopy up there that have their own species assemblages. They have the understory, both in, you know, they have invertebrates and vertebrates and plant life below them. They have the whole dynamics in them. They have the whole nutrient cycling and energy flow, flow through the forests. Well, kelp forests are really the anal analogy. They are the big forests of um, the, the ocean environment, whether you're thinking of redwoods or sequoias or pick your favorite forest uh, tree. And so <clears throat> within this, we can think about foundation species, but Kelps really come in a number of forms. They're not only these big three-dimensional structures. Some of them are close, uh, close to the bottom. Um, they form canopies just off the, you know, off the substrate. Some of them are in the inner tidal. Uh, but they're all really fulfilling the same role um, as these foundation species. Um, in addition to foundation species, we might think about things like keystone species. Um, a sea otter is the one that I'm going to pose today because this is where the story um, kind of begins with this, and they have a huge impact on their environment relative to their abundance. Um, <clears throat> in addition to those, we have apex predators. Um, and again, the one I'm going to pick today um, is the, the uh, killer whale. I'm not going to spend much time on this. This work has been um, one of the things that kind of helped motivate the project. But I will just point out here, this is off of one of the Aleutian Islands. This is a killer whale foraging um, through one of our dive sites with kelp draped off its dorsal fin. Um, <clears throat> so. Go, now, taking this to the Aleutian Islands, uh, we have these kelp forests up there that there's incredibly um, dynamic forests, they're really species, specious. Um, they have a lot going on in there. And <clears throat> this kind of is motivated from a paper that was put out by um, Jim Estes and his colleagues and a, and a whole study that was done by them looking at trophic cascades. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this cascade, but just to kind of set the framework, 
We had a situation where historically we had abundant sea otters up in the Aleutian Islands, which had a huge impact knocking down um, the primary herbivore up there, that is uh, green sea urchins. And then these things with uh, these numbers are really low. They had a rather small effect or a low grazing pressure on the algae and had these abundant kelp forests throughout the Aleutians. Um, and around the 80s or so, we saw that the sea otter populations were uh, declined dramatically. And when we're up there now, we sometimes will spend a two-week cruise up there and see maybe one or two sea otters, where before we were seeing rafts of hundreds of them when we began the study. So the sea otter populations have largely declined. The idea put, uh, postulated by Estes and colleagues was by a dietary renaissance by the killer whales. Um, that is a whole another side of the story. But one thing that's for absolute certain is that when the, uh, when the otters disappeared, we had a huge increase in sea urchin biomass. We had a huge increase in grazing intensity and the fleshy algae largely disappeared through a lot of the Aleutians. Um, and so this is the, where I want to begin my part of the study and talk about what does this actually mean to have huge outbreaks of herbivores and a loss of primary producers. And so if you went up to the Aleutians and you did a dive in a kelp forest up there, it might be so it looks something like this, the dra what we call the dragon kelp, Eularia fistulosa, which is our canopy forming, our big 3D species that forms everything to the water column, and a whole host of understory kelps um, and fleshy algae that, that create the habitat below it. <clears throat> but following this decline of those, I've talked about this breakout of sea urchins, and so now what we see up there is primarily the habitat is now dominated by sea urchin barrens, where we've got a uh, very little to no fleshy macroalgae, and often really, really, really high abundance of sea urchins. And these things can look like this for hundreds of kilometers. And so <clears throat> the problem with all this is, is that to begin to ask, well, what does this actually mean for the ecosystem? And so one thing I want to point out is that it's not all barren grounds. Even in the same habitat, we often have a situation where we have some topographic heterogeneity. Basically, you might want to call them um, pillars or pinnacles underwater or large boulders. As the wave orbitals pass over them, you know, that wave energy gets transmitted towards almost entirely horizontal back and forth, and it accelerates over the tops of these pinnacles, creating an area of really high hydrodynamic forces. And the algae on top of these whip back and forth, and they can actually keep the sea urchins at bay. And so that was some work that I did with Brenda Conner um, some years ago. And But the end result of this is we end up with situations that we call transition forests that are somewhere, they're not fully urchin barrens yet, but the primary, most of the macroalgae has been lost. And you have these kelps sitting on the top of these little elevated areas. <clears throat> and so asking the question, what happened when you went from kelp forest through these transition forests into urchin barrens is where um, kind of the next thing I'm, I'm, we're, we're looking at within our, with our work. And so some of the work that's happened that's come before us and some of the work that's come out of the lab that I was a graduate student in when I worked with Jim Estes for my PhD. Um, I did not work in the Aleutians for my PhD. I worked along <laughs> the Baja California and Mexico coastlines and in California, but I got to go up to the Aleutians several times. And after about 12 years of working in Baja, that funding became a little more difficult to chase down. Um, funding for work in Alaska came, got a little bit better. I fell in love with that up there and I've been working up there for about the last 12 years. And so one of the things we've seen is if we compare areas with lots of kelp versus areas without kelp, and we look at things like fish abundance, rock reeling abundance, and these are different islands we see, but the take home is that where it's gold and yellow, that's where we have no kelp, and where it's blue, we have kelp dominated communities. And what we see is where we have kelp, we have high abundances of fish. And where we lose the kelp, those abundances go down. Um, we might look at how uh, muscle and barnacle growth look. Um, the kelp deteriorates, becomes particulate. So we might look at barnacles, we might look at the size of barnacles with kelp. They're bigger than they are without kelp. Um, we look, might look at muscle growth rates. They grow faster with kelp, without kelp. We might look at this kind of taking a step up out of the water into things like glaucous wing gold diets. And we might see where there's kelp. There's a, a lot of fish in their diets. Not surprising, there's more fish where there's kelp. Um, Sea urchins are a small part of their diet. It's because that's not where the sea urchins are and other inverts. But as you lose the kelp and they transition to urchin bearing grounds, the fish become less important. The sea urchin others and other inverters become more important parts of their diet. We might go up to even a, a one step up in the trophic um, you know, uh, lineage. And we might look at things like mammal uh, diets for bald eagles, where there's kelp and there's otters. There's a higher preponderance of mammals, often otter pups, in the bald eagle diets. 
there's more fish in their diets, and but when you lose the kelp, the number of otters and the number of mammals in the bald eagle diets goes down, fish goes down, but other birds, things like um, eider ducks, which are in competition with the otters, they go up in abundance. To put all this in perspective, really, we kind of go from this, I, this classic idea of a simple food chain, um, where we might have something like this, to really something that's far more complex, or you might think of a tangle bank, where this thing has infected a whole bunch of other aspects of the, the ecosystem and the trophic interactions. The interaction webs change great, greatly. But the work I want to talk to you about today is what about what does this mean for out, step outside the food web? Let's look at uh, things like ecosystem function. And here I'm going to talk today about four, kind of give you four vignettes of ecosystem function. One of them is carbon uptake and storage. One of them is physiology. Um, one of them is biodiversity. And then I'm really going to uh, spend most of my time talking about primary production within the ecosystem. And so really quickly, just if we look at how much carbon is locked up, it's not truly stored because kelps turn over. Their biomass turns over maybe 10 times a year. But if we look at areas where we have the biomass of kelp on the rocky reef, the percent of the kelp that is carbon, we can take that kelp, figure out how much of the biomass is carbon, um, convert to dry weight. And we can take those and we can kind of multiply this by the area of the habitat that's still kelp forest relative to maybe what was historically kelp forest. We can get an effect of what happened when we lost the kelp forest. And simply put, with the areas, scenarios with the kelp forest, we have about 180 grams of kelp per meter squared, and scenarios without them, we have about 1% of that. So really, then, when you put this together, it's you know, equivalent to about 99% loss of standing stock. Again, it's not truly carbon storage because it helps turn over, but we do lose that ability of having that carbon locked up in a standing stock. And so the question then is, what does this mean for things like ecosystem function? And here again, the next things I'm going to talk about are physiology, biodiversity, and primary production. And so the idea of transitioning from kelp forest through the through, into urchin barrens, um, we can look at things like kelp physiology. And you can't do this in the barrens because there's no kelp. So we can compare the barren grounds to those transition forests and, think, and look at how does the kelp behave in these? Is it the same thing or does the kelp change its... Um, way it photosynthesizes and it reproduces and things like that. And so um, here we can look at the different habitats, ask how they differ with regard to irradiance, photosynthesis, things like kelp fecundity. And so you can go down, we can take measurements of irradiance within these habitats and plot them and compare them between the habit and these two um, kind of ecosystems or these two habitats. And the first thing I want to show you is that when you look at irradiance and within the habitats, the kelp forests are actually a little shallower than many of the bearing grounds. These transition forests are shallower. That's not surprising. I already mentioned that, you know, the kelp forests are really on these elevated pinnacles and things where the orbital is, the wave energy is a little greater. So the kelp forests are shallower, but if you notice, even though they're shallower, they're darker. There's more kelp, there's more things blocking the light, there's more shading going on. And so the, looking at this, they, they're darker, but what does that actually mean? Well, we can take kelp, put them in bio BOD bottles, biological oxygen demand bottles, and look at the relationship between irradiance and photosynthesis. And we can measure photosynthesis one of two ways. We can measure the oxygen evolution, or we can look at a carbon uptake. And the two are, they're stoichiometrically linked, but the photosynthetic quotient, they're not exact, but they do follow the exact same pattern. And what we see when you look at this is that if you went to the irradiance, that we, the average irradiance within a kelp bed would be about here, and you can look at how much fast it's photosynthesizing at that average irradiance. You can then go to a uh, transition force and look at where its, where its irradiance is and how those kelps would be photosynthesizing. And then we often, what we see is there's higher photosynthesis where there's more light. That's not totally surprising, but it's kind of a nice way of showing that these transition forests, they're brighter, the kelps are indeed photosynthesizing more. And so if they're getting more light and more energy, the question becomes, does more energy equal greater fecundity. I show this, and some people might get uh, the reference of, you know, if you step into kind of uh, movie literature, you might see something like this. But the point of this is if we look at this, and we look at kelp fecundity, and when you're looking at kelp fecundity for Yule area, the reproductive parts of the kelp are in specialized blades we call sporophylls, and for this particular species, they're located near the bottom of the um, individuals. And so we can look at the sporophyll mass, we can look at that for any given sporophyll mass, for any given single um, sporophyll blade, how much spores is it producing? And then we can actually get an idea of how fecund these individuals are. 
And so if we look at just sporophyll bundle mass, what we see is the transition and the kelps are actually different. There actually are more, the sporophylls are larger in the transition zones on each individual kelp. kelp. We can also then look at the number of spores produced per sporophyll or per unit area of sporophyll. And we see again that not only are those spore, are the, the kelps within the transition zones have, do they have larger reproductive masses, for, any, for those reproductive masses are actually more fecund per unit area. And when you put these two together, and we look at this across <laughs> the number of islands, Unasca, Atka, Adak, Tanaga, Agatu, Shemia, and Chicka, these are just Aleutian islands we work at. And if you transition these, there's no error bars because now we're using island as replicates here. But what we see is that the kelp forests and the, uh, are, are significantly less fecund than they are on the barren grounds. So transitioning from the kelp into the bearing, there was an, a difference in, um, in uh, physiology, in photosynthesis, and in fecundity. And that the, the bearing grains, even though they're less abundant, they're probably um, contributing disproportionately more to the spore population out there. And so <clears throat> stepping back and looking at these three habitats, we can then say, how did the, uh, the reduction of kelp forests and the increase in, a rate in the urchin barrens impact broad scale patterns of bio biodiversity? We've already talked about this. We've lost carbon storage. Um, we've lost fecundity as we move. Uh, sorry, we've lost carbon storage. We've increased in fecundity, but overall, we've lost a bunch of that spore producing. And so what we see here is that the hypothesis, this would, uh, this would result in large changes in biodiversity. And so the, to address this, um, my colleague Brenda and I, we went out, we had a couple of uh, trips out, or we had five trips out in the Aleutians to look at this over two uh, NSF cycles. And we went to um, these uh, different islands. These were 11 islands we worked at throughout the Aleutian chain. We tried to separate them among the island groups. So we got a nice broad scale pattern of what we're, of the, of what we're looking at. And we did this on your boat. The, uh, the last two one were on the RV Oceans. And so, we went on the, on the Oceanus, and the Aleutians are a beautiful place to work for those of you who have been fortunate enough to get out there. Um, you know, the deadliest catch sensationalizes everything. It's not that rough out there, but it does get rough. But the Aleutians are beautiful. These, these you know, snow-capped volcanic peaks that come right out of the ocean. It's an amazing place to work. Um, sometimes you look at the porthole and you see that, you know, and yeah, sometimes you look at the porthole and you see that. And I have some videos that I've taken out of this because they, they sensationalize it, but it does get, you know, pretty rough up there. But when it's not rough, the Aleutians are beautiful. Um, this is the island of four mountains, Chukitignac, um, where this is the uh, Oceanus down here, which you see down there. And it's an amazing place you know, to, go out, to go out and do this kind of work. And so we went up there and we did some biodiversity sampling across this. And we did approach biodiversity in three different sampling ways. We did look at percent bottom cover, where we visually estimated the bottom cover of different um, organisms. We did quadrat scrapes where we looked at the biomass, took everything to the lab, separated it out the way you would sort to get real fine scale tech, um, you know, taxonomy, and then um, uh, weigh each one so we get a biomass. And then we did big swaths where the big mobile things in the kelps, things that would be too uh, broadly dispersed are um, to uh, do in these smaller scale kind of sampling efforts. And when you put these together, you can look at just an MDS plot. Um, we can look at this and we can kind of see that, yeah, the kelp forests certainly group out different from the urchin barrens and the transition forests. And this is prim primarily due to the kelps being higher in kelps, Eularia and say Saccharina, and the urchin barrens being more abundant in, um, in urchins. And it's not surprising, this is, you know, kind of, this is, cir this is circular in, a, in, in our, in a, you know, the way of discussing it. So we can pull the kelps and the urchins out and ask, what about the rest of the community? And so, just really briefly, um, before I get to that, the kelp forest, again, they have um, the canopy kelp, so Eularia are present, the subcanopy algae are present, the sea urchins are sparse, the urchin barrens, the canopies are absent, the subcanopies are absent, the sea urchins are abundant, and in the transition forest, the canopies, again, remember, are present, but the subcanopies are absent, and the sea urchins are abundant. That's kind of the way I motivated the story to talk about. It's nice when your sampling design shows that to be the case. And so when you take those, the kelps and the urchin barren and the urchins out of the equation, we again see that the, the sites are, the three habitats are different. And in particular, the kelp forests are different from both the transition forests and the urchin barrens.
but the transition force and the bearings aren't different from one another. If you go back to that picture, the kelps are up on those little pinnacles, but the rest of it looks like an urchin barren. So it's not all that surprising they're really different because that benthos really has already become an urchin barren ground. And so the way these really different, if you look at these, the kelp forests are much higher in suspension feeders. Well, well, the um, <clears throat> transition forests, you can see are really high in the encrusting coral and algae. Um, they have more bare space. They have less holdfasts. The big difference here are really suspension feeders, things like codium, encrusting coral, and algae. Those are the things that are really driving this difference here. And so <clears throat> we could also look at things like other invertebrates. We see that you know, things like bivalves um, are going to be higher in the kelp forests here. Um, some of your stars are higher in the kelp forests than they are in their other ha habitats. But when you go over to the urchin barren grounds, um, you might see things you know, that over here that they uh, become lower here in some of these other ones. And so the big thing here is that the kelp forests have these much more diverse invertebrate and algal assemblages than the other two habitats. That's kind of the take home from that. I'm um, even taking the urchins out of it. It's really, there's more inverts in those kelp beds. And so the inclusion again of that is the loss of the kelp forest or deforestation, we'll call this, has resulted in widespread changes to the benthic biodiversity. The algae and invertebrates were more abundant in the kelp forest, but urchins were more abundant in the barrens. The transition forests were somewhat intermediate. They, you know, those benthic things look the same, but when you put the, the big eulary in, the, in, the, in with it, they're kind of somewhere in the middle. They're not quite fully urchin barrens yet. So <clears throat> looking at this, we can, we can kind of characterize these things this way with regard to light, um, fleshy algae, and urchins, and they kind of follow the pattern that I, I set this up with that the kelp forest really a few urchins, lots of algae, low light, all the way down to the urchin barrens, which have lots of urchins, high light, and few out, and few fleshy algae. So <clears throat> that's kind of the first, uh, the first three vignettes. I wanted to kind of get through those because as I mentioned, what I really want to talk about is how did these, um, the reduction of kelp forest and the increase in urchin barrens impact ecosystem function? Um, ecosystem function is a laden term. Um, it means different things to different people. Um, I'm going to approach this from the aspect of biodiversity and ecosystem primary productivity is how I'm going to define that today. Um, some people might have their own favorite way of talking about it, but those are the two I'm going to focus on. And so uh, the hypothesis that we went into, and this was um, that I, we wrote the NSF about, was that this would re uh, result in a decrease in biodiversity and a decrease in net community production. And so. To address this, um, we worked with an engineer, Mark Hitte, um, at San Diego State, who's worked with Forrest Rower and Jen Smith. Forrest Rower's at San Diego State, Jen Smith's at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And they've done things on coral reefs. We wanted to take some of the things they had uh, designed, developed for the coral reefs, and take them into a kelp bed. And so what we've got here are what we call collapsible benthic isolation tents. They're essentially benthic chambers. But these things have the polycarbonate walls, which allow full light transition. The polycarbonate walls are very rugged, but they're very thin. And that allows wave beat, surf beat, to, to transition into the inside of the chamber, which is really important to allow that energy to transition in, inside it so you don't have dead water building up inside. You want the water to circulate, but you want to break down boundary layer formation around the algae. Otherwise, they're not going to be behaving the way you would hope they would. And so <clears throat> these things were flexible. They had a, a, a skirt around the edge of it that when you laid heavy chain around would create a seal around it. We tested this by injecting fluorescein dye into it. And the seals, you know, were not 100% effective, but um, very effective at reducing water exchange from the outside. So you essentially are having um, an internal chamber design that's under natural conditions, natural hydrodynamic and light conditions, and it's sealed off. And so you can measure things within this chamber. And then with these chains, hold these things down. And so what these things look like, this is what one might look like in an urchin barren. You can see here we have oxygen and light sensors. We use Odyssey PAR loggers. We use um, PME mini dots to measure oxygen, measure temperature. And we also have these things externally to measure what's happening naturally in the environment. Um, that makes the talk too big today. So I'm going to just focus on what's happening within the chambers. And this allows us to get to isolate the seawater in from um, the outside environment. So we can measure things like photosynthesis and respiration by at the benthos. Um, we deployed three chambers in each of these habitats, that is kelp forest, urchin barrens, and transitions across on all 11 islands. Each deployment lasted around 36 hours, which allows us to truncate it and get an entire diurnal cycle because we needed that nighttime respiration. 
And so this is what one might look like in a transition forest and what one of these looks like in a kelp forest. And so when we look at this, the first thing we wanted to know is, okay, well, how did the chambers, what was inside the chambers reflect what we were, were looking at in the environment? I already told you about our broad scale sampling, how the differences looked with regard to algae and invertebrates. Wanted to make sure that what was inside the chamber was mimicking that. We also wanted to know when we measured photosynthesis and, the radiant, uh, and, and respiration in the chamber, we wanted to be able to scale it to who was in there, how much of each species was in there, and what were they doing. And I'll come back to that at the end. But this allowed, allowed us to kind of not only show that we are, we've deployed these things and they, they represented what we were looking at, but it also allowed us to kind of understand and give kind of a context to the patterns we saw. And the first thing we see is that the kelp beds were kelp beds. They had very low um, urchin densities and they had lots of macroalgae. Of course, macroalgae is variable. Not every place is covered in macroalgae. But the big thing is we got we have nice macroalgal cover, but very low urchin cover within these. The urchin barrens and the things were urchin barrens. We had very low macroalgae in them, but the urchin, urchin density crossed it. And the transition zone, except for when I'm trying to draw here with my mouse after I've had a bunch of coffee, um, looks pretty much intermediate to the two. And so we did see that these things were, in fact, what we expected. They were nice representations of the environment. And so when you look at what's in these, and first thing we see is that within the kelp beds, they're dominated by algae and low inverts. The transitions, uh, the barrens had very little algae, lots of inverts, and which were mostly um, uh, ur uh, inver uh, urchins, excuse me. And then transition zones were pretty similar to the barrens, but somewhat intermediate, but closer to the barrens. We look at lights within these, and then what we see here is these are light, uh, just a scatter plot of all the lights across all the chambers. And what we see is the barrens, actually everyone's dark at night, but during the day, the barrens have the brightest habitat, transition zones have the intermediate, and kelp beds have the lowest habitat. So once again, nice representation of what we were looking at in the, um, with our natural sampling. And so when you, take, when you do this, and you take one of these mini dots back and you download the data, you get a plot like this, Photosynthesis increases oxygen during the day, yet the night respiration drives it down at night, day sun comes up again, oxygen starts going up again. So you see this nice diurnal pattern in photosynthesis. And what we can do is we can collect the data every minute, we convert it to hourly averages, and we get rates of change determined by the hour to hour changes of this. That, bit, that is where we're looking at the slopes of the change. And we can scale by the chamber volume because these things, these um, chambers are pyramids. Even though they're flexible, they have uh, strict, uh, raw, uh, excuse me, metal framing to them. So we know the volume, we know the basal area of it, and we can actually begin to scale the oxygen production by <coughs> water volume and, and basal area of the, of the bentos. And then we can integrate this across the day and the night. And when we do that, first thing we look at is net community production. That is, the, what's the whole community doing? And here's NCP and milligrams of oxygen produced per meter squared per day in the three habitats. And the big thing I want to show you is that that's the zero line of uh, no net change. And there were no differences, not only among the habitats to each other, but they were not different from zero. And so this really kind of, when I step back, we wrote this NSF on this. <coughs> and when you step back on this, and our, we, we have to reject our original hypothesis. And so from this, you know, I'm sitting around going, oh my gosh, okay, what did we do wrong? And for those of you who have you know, been around uh, long enough, doing this long enough, what I'm about to say does not surprise you, but I would say something to this, particularly the students in the, in the lab who do your experiments and you end up with um, data that do not conf uh, confirm your hypothesis. Sometimes you go opposite your hypothesis. And I heard a, a comment once that said, trust your data, not your hypothesis. Um, and so utilize these things for greater understanding. Be willing to be wrong, right? And, and step in because when you're wrong, that makes you looking, okay, why was I wrong? And that actually is the next part of the story, what really helped us inform what's going on up there. And so stepping back with this, you know, I still had to figure out, okay, wh what did we do wrong? You know, we just got funded for three years ago, do this stuff, you know, it's not cheap stuff and there's nothing going on. Well, that's not the case because we realized that the systems are a host of lots of things, not just sea urchins and kelp. And 
there's things, all sorts of other algae. There's inverts, there's microbes in there. And some work I've done with some people in um, San Diego looking at, there's microbes that are associated with kelps that are in much greater abundance than just a few centimeters off the kelps. There's this whole other ecosystem that we need to think about. And these things are respiring. And so when we think about respiration, and we can't really do this during the day, but when you look at night, when photosynthesis is shut down, you can actually begin to look at how the system is respiring. And so if we look at the respiration by the community, what we see is the kelp forests are in fact respiring much higher, maybe a double, a twice what the rest of the others are. It's not much of a difference between the barren grounds and the transition habitats. Once again, they look pretty similar down there. But the kelp forests have a much greater respiration going on. And so you can also ask about, okay, if net community production is not different, but respiration is, what about gross community production? And just really briefly, um, think about your paycheck. What you get is, you know, you get your, the gross, what they, you pay out is your taxes, and what you keep is your net, right? And so here, um, we have to think about our gross community production being a combination of net community production and respiration. I've already said that zero, that's much bigger than the kelp forest. So what does gross community production look like? This is really the production by the autotrophs alone. And so when we look at that, we see much, uh, the story starts to emerge. We see that gross community production, again, is much greater, maybe you know, not quite double, but significantly greater in the kelp forest than it is in the, either the transition zone or the, um, the barrens. And the barrens and the transition forest really aren't that different from one another. They're similar on the bottom. But the kelp forests are, they do have a much greater gross production and a greater respiration. So if you look at that difference between how the, the gross uh, primary production and respiration, we see that the kelp forests have a much broader span. They have much higher production, gross production, much uh, higher respiration, which is a negative number because that's oxygen being um, taken up, and they come to zero. The rest are, have a little production, little respiration, and they're coming to zero. So that zero mark in net is not really surprising. Um, and the estimate of ecosystem function lost was we were wrong when I, you know, it's in the title of my NSF proposal, um, and it was wrong. But really what the function, what's what the ecosystem function loss has to do with the production by the autotrophs and the respiration by the whole communities, and those were very different. So when we do that and we go back to net community production and we recognize that they're, that they're zero, the, the thing is, are they really in balance? I just mentioned that, you know, you're, you're up a really high gross production, really high uh, net, and then they come to zero. You can go chamber by chamber. There's um, almost 100 deployments we did in this thing and ask, do we actually see these things summing to zero going chamber by chamber by chamber? And to look at that and comparing production and respiration, we would expect a one-to-one -one line if they're truly in balance. That is, for any gross production, we should see a one-to-one -one relationship with respiration. And this should go across any level of gross production and respiration. If what I just said is true, that it's really the system's in balance. And when we do that, we see something like this. Across all chambers, we see that there's, you know, don't let that slight little difference here, you know, fool you. These things are not significantly different from one another. You have simple analysis of covariance. The slopes are not different from one another. The elevations are not different from one another. And in fact, these things, none of these things are different. They're the same. Not only that, none of these are different from a one-to-one -one slope. So this idea that respiration and growth per, um, primary production were in balance holds true across all of our, um, our deployments, which means that even though we've lost this respiration by the community, we've lost the gross primary production in the, um, by the autotrophs, the system has remained in balance. And so we can look at it this way. We can go chamber by chamber, look at a histogram, and we can look at those slopes, and they should be centered around one, with some chambers being a little more production driven, some chambers being a little more respiration driven, variations to slice of life. And we see that, in fact, they're all centered right around one. And so the one thing that surprised me, though, is that, okay, I would have accepted that. But then I you know, kind of went in at the very beginning and said, well, then you should have still seen some of the bigger ones over in the gross production respiration here in the kelp beds. I should have had some of the largest numbers. When in reality, the largest numbers were 
up here in the barren grounds. The average is slightly higher, and you have some of the biggest slopes in the barrens, which means that they're more production-driven than respiration-driven. That, again, was one of these things that kind of made me step back and go, all right, what's going on? Um, well, reality is, if you bend to the Aleutians, it's low lights much of the time. And these things are not, when you look at those P versus I curves, these things are not operating at this optimal density. They're way at that left. Saying, when I showed you those P versus I curves earlier, we weren't all the way over where kelps were maximizing the photosynthesis. We are back on the left side of that curve where we're just above respiration. And these things are not really photosynthesizing at their maximum. So it's not surprising that we don't see these huge gross productions within the kelp beds. But I was curious as to why the barren grounds had these highest production numbers. And that came down to things like compensatory production. When you remove the kelps, you remove those understories, the light's a little brighter. You've got things like bethic diatoms. You've got things like the Preston corallins out there that are also primary producers. And so what we believe is happening, and we don't know this right yet, but we need to do some kind of chamber experiments that isolate, that blocks out the bottom. But we think compensatory production is what's happening, and there's a few of the chambers where these things were really high. All right. So if I, if I have, I hope I've convinced you that when we've had the change from kelp forest through the transition zones to urchin barrens, that well, even though net production wasn't, we have had this huge change in the way the ecosystem, if the autotrophs are producing, the respir respirers are respiring, and that this is really how the system has changed. That range between the two of them is probably our best estimate of the ecosystem function that's been lost. The next question is to say, okay, if that's true, can we then go in and find out who is there? We've already done all these scrapes. We know who's there. We know how many of them are there. We know their biomass in these three habitats. Can we, we kind of take the, decompartmentalize the system, isolate each one in, in, on their own, put them back together, and do they make sense? And that's kind of where we are right now with this. We're taking all of, all of our species, our autotrophs, our invertebrates, weighing them, getting their biomass. We can then put these things in biological oxygen demand on chambers, BOD chambers, measure respiration, and things like, you know, even sponges and um, things like that. The urchins, we could put the kelps in these things, measure these things under relevant irradiances, and begin to ask, okay, how much production was lost by the autotrophs by each species? What's their biomass? How much respiration was lost or was gained by the urchins increasing? What's their biomass? And same thing with the sponges. And, we're getting, and that's what we're doing right now. It's taken us a long time. This is probably going to be another year to go through and do all of the, the calculations. But we're trying to reconstruct the, the ecosystem by doing these things, by looking at the are the sum of the parts equal to the whole. And so when you do this, just really briefly, we can go back to those scrapes that I showed you earlier, and we see that within the kelp beds, transition and barren grounds, we can look at the kelps, the reds, other brown algae, the green algae, and what you really notice is that it's really about the kelps. There, yeah, there are other species of, of algae there, but by biomass, what's been lost are the kelps. Sorry, Gal. <laughs> um, but as far as production goes, that's... That's, and by biomass, that's what's happening. And so we can do this for, here's three species of uh, uh, kelps. We can look at their, again, their P versus I curves. We can then combine these things with what we know about irradiance at the benthos within these habitats. And then we can begin to model how much oxygen should have been produced by those. And then we can also go to things like Eularia, which spans the water column. And we can look at things like, um, how much is, is for the layer at the bottom? Well, what about midwater and, and the surface? I haven't really talked about that today. But what we see is at the surface, these things are, are um, photosynthesizing much higher. They saturate at a higher irradiance, and th it's brighter at the surface. And so we can begin to model not only Eulary at the bottom, but we can then take Eulary throughout the water column. We can then combine these things with what we know about irradiance, and this is what we're trying to calculate as far as um, what's happened with the, 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 the seaweeds. We can look at the invertebrates in the chambers, and here's a, kind of the major groups of invertebrates we've looked at within the groups. And the big thing we see is that you come down here, Strongylus and Trotus, the urchins, and really it's about the urchins, with the exception of within the, the kelp beds, there's a lot of bryozoans in some of these, but really the story is about the urchins here. And so we can realize that, okay, urchins are not all the same. Urchins differ within their size. We can go in and we can look at this. The kelp forest, what we see, um, and you can look at the percent of the total. 
within the kelp forest um, have very very few small ones, but lots of big ones. The, the urchin barren grounds are kind of all over. But the thing is, is that not only does urchin barren does urchin size vary, urchin size varies by habitat. So we now need to consider different sizes of urchins. We also need to realize that urchin size varies by island. They're not the same throughout the islands. Here's here's kind of um, plots for uh, for size on the on the um, x-axis, the uh, the number of urchins we've seen on the y-axis across Unaska, Chukadignac, and um, and Anangula and Alaska, a whole bunch of different islands. And what we see is from island to island, the average size is varying. So we need to take a very specific um, look at the urchins and understand their size frequency histograms, not only their abundance and biomass. And when we do that, we can put urchins in here in these chambers, measure the respiration for different size urchins. And this is work by, again, Ju Young Kim, um, who was a postdoc who's now a professor in uh, Kunsan University, who joined us on a couple of our trips. And the one thing I just want to show you is that the reason why this is really important, if we look at urchin respiration and we look at just as just the dia test diameter of the urchins, as the test diameter gets bigger, guess what? Urchins respiration gets more. Bigger things respire more. But on a per gram basis, it goes down. Bigger things might respire more, absolutely, but bigger things are more efficient, right? Surface to volume ratios for other, <clears throat> other reasons. But we see, so it's not so clear that just size matters. We've got to look at the individual and understand how many of each urchins of each different size class there are to begin to reconstruct this. This is why this is taking us a long time to go through and calculate all this. <clears throat> and so we can do this for the, uh, all the dominant taxa, measure their respiration. These chambers, by the way, are hooked up to the flow-through system on the boat, so they're, everything's held at the natural um, conditions within the field. And so, real briefly, you can just, this is just a kind of a teaser for what's to come. Um, again, we have a lot more work to go on this, but we can kind of look at respiration, um, that is oxygen, um, taken up per gram of phallus or per gram of body of each of these per hour. And we can see for, the, for a whole host of, of different um, taxa that not everyone respires the same, but we can actually get estimates of what they're doing. And then we can scale these by their biomass in the field and within the different habitats to understand how those different um, habitats are kind of uh, habitat types are behaving. <laughs> so, Kind of taking this back and getting ready to start to kind of wrap this up, I started off by talking about these three zones, the kelp forest, the transition zones, or forests, and the, um, the urchin barrens. Once again, we might see few urchins in the kelp forest, lots of other inverts, lots of algae, low light, kind of moderate through here to lots of urchins, few other inverts, few algae, high light. I might add on to that that we have high community respiration, high gross primary uh, community production, but near zero net community production. Here we have low respiration, low gross community production, and near zero respiration. Probably, and some maybe some compensatory production goes on, goes on. But one thing is very clear, our net community production that we originally sold this on was a very poor indicator of changes in ecosystem function. Um, it really required, again, a deeper thought. And I would encourage you know, the grad students in here, when it doesn't quite match, step back, instead of questioning your data, step back and think about, all right, Trust your data, as long as you did a good job. I mean, if you didn't do a good job collecting your data, right? There's nothing I, we can do to help you. Um, <laughs> but um, as long as you did your due diligence and planned ahead and, and, uh, and employed your uh, proper sampling design and, and put some forethought and actually did your, a good job and they don't match hypothesis, question your hypothesis. All right, so um, <clears throat> summary and conclusions to wrap this up. Um, the macroalgae and invertebrates, except for the urchins, were most abundant in the kelps, with deforest lead, uh, deforestation leading to the declines. Hope that's been clear. Um, gross community production and community respiration were greatest in the kelp forest, but net community production did not differ among the habitats. Um, gross primary production and respiration are in balance in all three habitats, and I actually this this caused me to get into the literature on um, the balance between gross community production and respiration, which I had not done my due diligence um, and understanding that. And when I got into the literature, guess what? This kind of follows theory. Um, and actually, there is theory out there that says these things should be balanced around one. The kind of net autotrophic communities tend to be higher, a uh, little bit above one on this. Things that are a little bit more respiration driven or heterotrophic tend to be below zero, but they tend to be centered around balance. 
changes in uh, change in species assemblages, food webs, physiology, carbon storage, gross community production, and respiration together, not what we sold the proposal on, are the best in form of the ecosystem function lost. Um, all right, so as I wrap this up, um, I just want to thank uh, my collaborators on this, particularly Dr. Brenda Konar um, from University of Alaska Fairbanks, who I've known since uh, we were both students at Moss Landing. The other um, fabulous person to work with, really good um, in the field, and it's just been someone that's been really fun to spend um, a lot of time out on ships on. I'm Dr. ji Kim, who taught me a diving. I'm a quadratic ecologist. I like, you know, like to count things underwater, cut it, cage it, count it, you know, look at how systems respond. That's kind of where I cut my teeth. Um, I had to learn a lot about physiology to understand why what the patterns we're seeing. So ji was instrumental in bringing a lot of that to my lab. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank um, my lab, the Beer Pigs, which stands for Bethic Ecology Experimental Research, Phycology in general. Um, and thank them, uh, Sadie, Ji Young, Pike, Tristan, Scotty, and Genoa. I'm great students to, uh, to, to take on the field on a couple of cruises with us. Um, we have a traveling museum exhibit. This was picked up and it's traveling around um, Alaska. It's been, I think it's a, a museum of the north right now um, that details this, um, a lot of the changes that we've seen. Um, so I want to thank them. And then um, I really want to thank, um, this has been a number of cruises that this stuff has taken. You probably saw some of the data. We're back for 2012. Um, we've taken the Tommy Thompson up there, the Point Sur, um, the RV Oceanus. Um, the ship support has been fantastic. Um, uh, uh, Stuart Lamberton, who was the superintendent of the, of the, the Point Sur for two years when we took it, and of the Oceanus, ran an amazing ship. I really appreciated the crews of those boats. They're incredibly good at helping us get this stuff done. Um, so I want to thank them very much. Um, and so with that, um, I think I'm going to leave that there, um, and then we'll wrap it up and take any questions here. So the thing about these like pyramids, from my understanding, these are actually closed chambers, and they're probably carbon walls. Yes. So there's no flux in and out of those chambers except for light. Correct. Um, so do you think that that affects kind of the, what you observed as far as this equilibrium state or that, you know, there's no uh, kind of balance between production and respiration there? No, we don't think it's a chamber effect and uh, for a number of reasons why. Um, the, first, the, the amount of work that was done with these things in the coral, in, in the, um, the tropics with Jen Smith and Forest Rowers Lab, they kind of vetted a lot of these, but we did a bunch of pre-testing on these things. We did a lot of um, things, you know, just doing simple water milk clod cards to, uh, development. We put in light sensors, we put in um, things where we're measuring pH inside and outside to test just chamber effects. We spent six months just testing how the chambers behaved. Um, and we couldn't identify them. I don't think so. I can't say no, they don't inf affect it. One thing, a reason why the pyramidal shape, that does two things for us, does three things. One, square, it reduces some drag because these things do start to move um, when the swell beat comes. If it's a square down there, it's got a different kind of drag forces. Um, another thing is that the pyramidal shape, that oscillation, more at the top and at the bottom, allowed for mixing within the chambers. Um, it, it allowed the shape of it, allowed that water with fluorescent and dye, allowed that water to mix much better. The other thing is, is you can take one of these things, a pyramid can collapse into two dimensions very quickly and pop open into three. When you're deploying these things in the, in the Bering Sea and you're, you know, the conditions are, you know, sometimes you gotta swim in to get to the right spots and stuff, we couldn't swim around big things up there. So what we did was we, um, these things were, were flat. You can just grab these things, you can grab three of them and swim with them. And so the chamber design was specific to for logistic reasons, but we did everything we can think of to make sure that. Yeah. But I was thinking more just from an equilibrium state. You know, like the limiting factor in that system is probably oxygen production through uh, right, through photosynthesis. Yeah. So if you ran any chamber long enough, essentially you would expect that drawdown to reach equilibrium. Uh, be limited by the oxygen produced by photosynthesis. Yes. So you'd almost always expect it to get to zero in a closed system. Whereas that would be different, of course. Yes. Okay. So yeah, it would go up. But the, if we, if you just measured starting at any point, absolutely. Um, we went slope. That's why. That's why we broke things down and the, and the incremental. So we were able to, to catch it going up and going down. So one. That's one reason why we did we use slopes on um, these. Another thing we did I didn't mention is that we actually did flushings to reset these things um, to make sure we didn't have any feedback loops. We we're really worried about feedback loops within the chambers, um, such that. 
Um, you know, they, it's like a pH drift experiment. If you have a lot of photosynthesis in, in there, the pH starts to change. That can influence physiology of things. So we wanted to make sure we weren't getting feedback loops, so we did some flushes with them. Um, two questions. One, with the urchins, you control your size of the urchins on, on the oxygen or respiration. And you showed that nice relationship between the urine and also the efficiency. But when you look at an urchin from a, a barren area and you crack it open, there's like nothing inside that <laughs> thing. And you take one from a kelp bed where there's a lot of food and they're, they're loaded with gonads. That's why the fisheries are in the kelp beds yep. when they're barren. Did you control for that aspect, not, not just size, but the, the condition of the, the urchins? Um, when I say fantastic question, only because it, it, well, it's a great question because that is what we're doing right now. I have an undergraduate who's doing a senior thesis with me who is looking at this. It's, it's same genera, Strangulus and Trotus purpuratus. Not, not these, but what we've done with those is we are collecting these from disparate habitats, putting them in chambers and asking, are they respiring at the same rates? We're then taking urchin barons, feeding them, and seeing if we can, if they do, do they change? And we're taking urchins from kelp forest, starving them, and we're doing that right now. Um, I don't have the answer for that, but it is a pertinent question, and that's what we're looking at right now. Okay, great. Second, quick question. Mm -hmm. um, when you're putting all your different organisms up, uh, biodiversity from the kelp bed in particular, which is a, a more detrital-based food web out there, I didn't see amphipods, isopods. Did, did you vacuum those up, or did you just no. not capture them? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So we did not, um, we got whatever came up in the mesh bags and we did count those. Not a perfect way of doing that. You know, we've done stuff in Baja where we actually use suction dredges to bring things up and to look at those. We weren't able to do that. A lot of that is um, when you're working up there, you can carry so much in, you know, trying to crack everything, cram everything in. So we weren't able to do it during logistics. Um, would be, you know, fantastic to know the, the little, you know, crustaceans and the very small things, their contribution. We don't know that right now. I've, I've joked with my students about taking a bunch of these things. You might have to take 50 little, you know, amphipods and put them into a chamber to get a, a single. But with something we're interested in, but we haven't done that. That question, I thought that, um, the urchins eat kelp. So in the, in the urchin barrens, what keeps them from most just starting out and dying? Um, well, we don't know. These things, there's a couple of things. First of all, what they can do is start to reabsorb the gonads. Uh, um, and so they can get energy from that, but that can only last for so long. These things have been urchin barons. You know, I started working up there in the uh, 90s, and these things have been urchin barons since. Um, so we don't absolutely totally know. I've heard some anecdotal stuff that they might be able to absorb some nutrients out of the water. Um, maybe they just kind of getting back to this thing. Maybe they just become zombie urchins and they just kind of close down and just have an incredibly low metabolic needs. Um, there is a little bit of subsidies that come in. The, the, because the, of the hydrodynamic forces around the islands in the first, oh, about a meter or so, there's really dense kelp beds um, in those. And we were talking about uh, laminar longipedes earlier. And so these really dense kelp that do fragment, and they do, it could be a subsidy that could happen very sporadically that just, you know, gets something every, like a, like a rattlesnake. One of my friends studies rattlesnakes. She said if they get one meal a year, but one meal every six months, they do okay. Uh, they just kind of shut down the rest of the time. And so maybe an urchin can just, you know, we don't see it. It can get something just every so often, and they can persist. Um, so I don't have, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's low metabolic needs here. This kind of relates to that. So when you have an ur ur urchin barren ground compared to kelp, the food chain dynamics changes to different animals are in each habitat totally. Mm -hmm. And so is there any records of what would make a change back to a kelp forest? I mean, or what, what causes that? I mean, it happens all over the world, I mean, in urban yeah. areas, but... Uh, it happens all over the world. Um, it happens differently in cold and warmer waters, right? Uh -huh. um, so in California, what, one of the things we've seen are, are disease outbreaks. Um, those are these things that we, that, um, one of the things that really help take urchins out. Periodic big storms can take them out, because these things are no longer hiding in cracks and crevices. Um, we, had, we did put in NSF, not, uh, wasn't funded, um, to look at, we've seen some evidence of uh, bald spot disease in the urchins up there. Um, we've looked at that, there is a Vibrio associated with it. Um, we weren't funded the first time. Um, we really needed a, some sort of a, um, a disease for somebody that has epidemiology to, to onboard. That was a comment, so you, you're a bunch of ecologists, you can do disease work, you need to bring a disease person in. 
And so personally, I think disease is what would, was what would reverse. I can't imagine anything that's going to operate over that big of an area on that many urchins um, other than something that's like a disease that's going to take them out. Um, we've seen some evidence in that in Norway. Uh, Norway has a, has a green urchin up there and same kind of thing. And there's been some um, disease outbreaks there that have seen some reverting to kelp, kelp beds. So my gut would be the only thing I can think of that would work would be disease. Yeah, we, we have urchin bear grounds intertidally, I mean, in a low intertidal, even on this coast, in many places. And sometimes they disappear. I've never quite yeah. figured out Huge why. Huge storms <laughs> into it, right? You know, these things can be dislodged, right? You know, all that energy in those waves, once you get down there, is strictly back and forth. And so the orbital accelerations can be amazing, you know, down there. So, um, you know, normally, well, in California, these things hide out. And in the Aleutians, there's not the top topographic rugosity isn't there. So there's not all the cracks and crevices and things that they can hide in. Um, but um, I would imagine that, you know, big sets of storms, but, you know, the Aleutians have big storms. Do they go deeper during times, you know, when, when the storms are coming? I, we don't know. You know, we can't get the ship up there and die during the winter. I'm not going to go do that during the winter. But um, uh, that's, that might be what happens. But yeah, we don't know. Yeah. So uh, sort of on that note, is do you mean the word transitional and for that, for that middle case to be one directional from kelp to urchin, or is this, do they exist as a mosaic of patchy, you know, all kinds of conditions, or is, or is it over time, what kind of time scale? Is um, they do not, they are not in a mosaic of positions. It is one of three states. Um, and it is, you know, they have these alternative stable states. Um, these things appear to be stable for long periods of time. We, I've been working up there. Well, the, the transition states are stable for a long time? Uh, yes, the transition states appear to be stable. Now, we think that they are slowly going to urchin barons over time. Um, but there's, you know, there's no kind of inner mosaic between, um, that we see. Um, <clears throat> and it happens quickly. You know, from one year to the next, we can see, you know, kelp forest became an urchin barren. We haven't seen any revert back. Um, that except for um, before, before I started working up there, as the sea otters began, were recovering um, from you know, being almost free, primarily extirpated, you know, the last the later part I want to say last century, the century before now, um, we did see recovery of some of the kelp beds because you know predation. The other thing you could take them out would be predation, um, but you need a predator that's going to operate over large areas. I was talking to the, um, Canadian Broadcasting, and they're asking about going out and smashing urchins. I said humans can do it on this scale. You need a predator that's out there foraging 24 hours a day over huge areas for a long periods of time, and so maybe predation. But right now, the otter numbers aren't up there to do this, and eider ducks, but they can't dive deep enough to get to get the deeper urchins. So um, the reverting, um, something's going to have to take them out, and I go back to diseases. So if you're if the transition zones are stable, it almost suggests that there's something special about those places that sets up conditions such that they can pers help can persist. Yeah. And have you thought about uh, manipulations? I mean, yes, we have actually, we have, we have done, we've got a, um, Brendan and I published a paper looking at stability where we actually went in and created, you know, into a kelp bed, created a little thing, uh, three meter by three meter. We went back um, two, one and two years later and the origins moved in and you've got a three meter by three meter. We marked the Z-spar, the, um, the boundary layer between these things that we, we think is just hydrodynamics going over these topographical features. We marked them, and two years after we marked them, we went back and they barren, the, the boundary had not moved more than that. And so they're incredibly stable, um, and hydrodynamics can do that. And so we think it's those, those transitions are, are truly driven by hydrodynamics, and as a, the, the kelps that are up there and other things whip back and forth and kind of keep them at bay. It's kind of whiplash effect. I think there is one over. Anyway, who, yeah. <laughs> long does Elaria fistulosa live? And are there, is there a mixed age strata on those, uh, the intermediate? And I think, it's a, I think it's an annual, um, or, or, or semi, you know, I think it's one to two years. I don't, I don't think the Elaria, the Elaria fistulosa lives that long. You, I might ask you that. Would the uh, <laughs> uh, urgents be more attracted to the younger uh, Elaria, or not really? Definitely I would imagine so, because I think, I know the sporophylls are chemically defended with fluorotannins. Um, I don't know that the blades are. They have a very different texture to them. You know, young, you know, the young kelps are more palatable to everything. You know, little herbivorous fishes, things like that. So that's kind of a, we know that young, young kelps are more palatable. So um, whether there's a... I mean, that might influence That's change. good, yeah. Do you see differences in growth or reproductive rates across organisms that are common in those three different environments? 
We haven't done that. I can uh, point to the work, uh, you know, by Dave Duggins and those people who did see uh, differences, at least in filter feeders. And that's probably due to the kelps breaking up and, um, you know, and becoming particulates and then feeding the system. Um, so, yes, yeah, so things that are filter feeders, yeah, there's going to be a lot more particulates within the kelp beds um, simply because of that. We've got um, one of my PhD students, Scott Guevara, has got, boy, he's collected thousand samples across the entire thing. He's looking at using stable isotopes right now to figure out who's eating whom. Um, and so he's got the entire base of the food web all the way up through, um, you know, herbivores, you know, kind of primary predators, and he's got a few of, you know, secondary predators. And so we're trying to look at, trying to understand the food web and you know, our size, but we haven't done any manipulations and looked at growth rates of things. Uh, you said that in the fecundity portion that the transitional plants had a higher fecundity than the kelp forest. Now, and you're saying that they're also landing or staying on a certain crop of land. Did you uh, segment your data for the kelp forest just to those similar type landings, or is it just? No, we didn't. Um, and so that wasn't something that we had gone into, you know, thinking about that. Um, the differences being, you know, the things that the, the kelp is a little shallower. These things, you know, we they, they top of these things might get a little shallow. We were looking at just from light, water motion, accelerating. All you know, these things also can facilitate what we call mass transport. Kelps don't take up nutrients by an ATP-driven process; they take it up by it's basically a diffusion-driven process. It's, and so, increased water motion over something, you can increase mass transport. Um, so that could that could be a very relevant uh, aspect of it. Um, but what we did look at was. Um, yeah, we, we know that they're brighter. We know that they do exhibit the same. We looked at the photosynthesis irradiance curve in the two habitats. They follow the same pattern. So they're not, there's the irradiance and photosynthesis relationship doesn't change. The functional relationship between those doesn't change. It's the same. So we do know that they are photosynthesizing more in the transition for us. And so we, that's where we came up with that conclusion, but we didn't standardize the same kind of thing. Um, the kelp force would have had a random mix of it. Else. All right. Oh, oh. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Right on. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, great. How are you doing? <laughs> right on. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, the diadema? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Ray Wells was someone who I, I remember seeing a talk to him, but it's been 20 years. I can't remember what caused that diet, but it was a virus. And they came back, though, right? Yeah, not a lot. I mean, they came back. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will. Yeah. The place is great. We got showing around today. Awesome place. Yeah. Yeah. And how many sure? And the final fix had a species lying on the it's lying on the surface. What was that? Oh, that is a Eulary canopy. So right here? Oh, okay. <laughs> and Kevin. Which, um, great help, man. I think it might be good. The folks had an appreciation for the field work done by you and your team. And the sense of the total dives, I have time associated with the project. Um, we're probably, each person is probably doing 50 dives on a trip. And we have 11 students with us plus two PIs. So there's, yeah. yeah, and that's, yeah, so yeah, and that's per trip. And so many hundreds. <laughs> Thank you everyone online for asking questions. We appreciate it. You can contact Matt directly if you have more questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I came in half hour late, so I may have already missed it.